Hey, welcome to Fathom. If you've got your Bibles, and I hope you do, let's grab them. Let's open them up to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy 4 is where we're going to be together today. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible with you, you can open a phone or a tablet to 1 Timothy 4. If you brought, uh, got one of those Bibles on the back ledges, uh, you can find 1 Timothy 4 on page 992. But we are walking through the, the book of 1 Timothy this fall, and that's where we're at, 1 Timothy 4. Today, as you meet me there, uh, today our text deals with the topic of legalism deals with the topic of legalism. It was a problem that Paul needed to address in his day. And by the way, it is a problem that we need to address address in our day, legalism. Now, if you are a Christian, if you've been following Jesus for any amount of time, you might in your mind have an image or an illustration of legalism that you've experienced or that you've heard of. And, and, and listen, to those of you who are newer to Christianity, you might even have a different version of what you think legalism in the church is. Uh, but, but, but sometimes we think of legalism or legalists in the church as kind of prudish, Ned Flanders-ish type of people. You follow me on that? Like we think of legalists just like kind of uptight, fuddy-duddies wearing three-piece brown polyester suits and that's like the legalist, you know, just kind of thumping people with their Bibles and they're legalists, right? Um, but but I, wanna, I wanna offer that maybe there's more to it than just that caricature, okay? Uh, I saw a Facebook post uh, asking this question. Has anybody ever had a bad church experience? And that Facebook post had like 5,000 comments on it. 5,000 comments, many of them having to do with legalism. Let me read you some of my favorites. A guy named Ryan said this, our church leaders believed that wearing blue jeans gave the impression of rebellion. Because nothing says rebellion like wearing blue jeans, right? Um, how many of you are wearing blue jeans today? Rebels. <laughs> Sinners, sinners. He goes on. Here was their mindset at this church. In the 1960s, hippies started wearing jeans. Now we have terrorism. Cause and effect. It's like, oh, okay. Uh, how do you argue with that logic, right? Okay, uh, another comment on that said this. Uh, our church believed that men shouldn't have facial hair. And it's like, have you seen any picture of Jesus? Glenn, you're out, buddy, right? <laughs> like, have, uh, re really? Like, uh, and what do you do with some of us who are just a bit hairier than others? Just prone to it, okay? I were at, a, at a previous church, I worked with a guy who was uh, furry. Yeah, like half Wookiee, half Chia Pet. <laughs> I mean, kind of a missing link. You know that guy? You, somebody know, know that guy? Um, literally, we were on a trip together, like a missions trip together. He didn't shave for a week straight, and his beard hair started growing and matching up with his neck hair. Like, it was just one big hair, and I was like, bro, you've got a felmet. He's like, what's a felmet? I'm like, it's a furry helmet, okay? You're a freak. Like, that. what do you do with that guy? Uh, another comment on this post, a church said that a guy brought a girl with him to his church and an usher said to this woman, ma'am, women aren't supposed to wear pants here. <laughs> to which she responded by grabbing her belt loops and started, and he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> Another comment from a gal named Kara said that at her youth group, you were not allowed to wear black polo shirts. Any other color was fine, but black meant that you, quote, loved the devil. Polo shirts, my friends. Rachel uh, said this, I grew up in a church that wouldn't let boys and girls swim together because the girls could get pregnant. That's not how that works. <laughs> it could lead to it, um, but that's not, how, that's not how that works. And then my favorite comment was from a girl named Cassie. Uh, Cassie said this, our church leaders would not let us trick or treat on Halloween because it was, quote, Satan's birthday. That was until our pastor had a baby born on Halloween. <laughs> and God said to his angels, let us sing, right? Like that's, I mean, it's, there's gotta be an incredible amount of laughter happening in heaven on that one. Now it's, listen, it's easy to snicker about these things. 
And, and I, I mean, it's actually great for my heart. It's like free counseling to do that, okay? But, but I have, I've met with people in my 20 years of ministry who have some real serious wounds and pains and memories be, be, because they were shunned or mocked or sometimes even like cast out of churches because they did not meet some sort of legalistic standard that was at that church. So before we jump into our text about legalism, let me start with just a simple definition for us, okay? Legalism is taking something that's a matter of conscience and elevating it to a command for all people. That's what legalism is. Legalism is, is a matter of conscience, something that you would say, hey, this is an important rule for me. It's a matter of conscience. This is what I do or I don't do. It's a matter that's for my conscience. And then it's taking that and it's applying it as a commandment for all people. And now normally legalisms start as good things. They're good things. They're not bad things. It's not like doing, you know, black tar heroin. And everybody else should do that too. That's not, like, that's insane. Everybody would be like, that's insane. It's normally taking a good thing and making it something for everybody. And, and we've always said this, that when you take a good thing and you turn it into a gospel thing, elevate it to a gospel thing, that's a really bad thing. That's legalism. So before we get into our text, uh, I, I just wanted to kind of start with that premise, taking things that are a matter of conscience and elevating it to a command. And I think it'll inform our text and then our application today. So we're going to see what Paul has to say in 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1 about the issue of legalism, because it was happening, obviously, in his context. So let's look at the text together. 1 Timothy 4, starting in verse 1. Now... The Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. So, so those are pretty hard-hitting words that, that Paul starts with. He starts by essentially saying this. The Holy Spirit has clearly told me something that I need to tell you. He says, the, the Lord has clearly revealed something to me, and that is that there are going to be people who leave the faith, who turn their back on Jesus, who walk away from the gospel because of legalism because of legalism. Now, we're going to see exactly what the legalistic things that will cause them to walk away are in the next verse, but before that, I just want you to note the language that he uses. They will devote themselves through the teaching of liars who have seared consciences through that kind of teaching. They will devote themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Now, that's wild language. That's wild language, but I just want you to pause for a second and think about the weight that Paul is putting on this. Sometimes we think of legalism and we think it's oh, that's something bad, it's something that we should avoid, it's a case of, of missing the point, or even that like caricature, again, that Ned Flanders sort of fuddy-duddy caricature, like somebody, some Christian who's just so out uh, of touch with reality that they're just kind of Bible-thumping everybody. And we think of it like that. But Paul is not saying, hey, this is a problem, but it's not that big of a problem. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying, this is a huge deal because legalism is deceitful, demonic, insincere, and from a seared conscience. That's the language that he uses. Why? Why is it so heavy? Why is it demonic? Because it leads people away from Christ. It leads people to reject the faith. It's not a small deal. Legalism is not a small deal. It's an enormous deal. Satan himself uses legalism to keep people away from Christ. Like, we, we think Satan works the most with, like, snakes and drinking blood and Halloween and, like, you know, demon possession and dead cats. 
which is just a benefit, right? Uh, <laughs> but, but we gotta throw some of, that, some of that nonsense out of our minds. Like Satan doesn't need to work like that. You know that, don't you? Second Corinthians says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. He, he takes, Satan takes good things and he just tweaks them to the point that people will walk away from the faith because of them. He doesn't need to be drinking, like us drinking blood and doing seances when he can just get us to be a little bit, adding a little bit to the gospel that would make people feel like they don't belong. So, so he calls legalism satanic. And then he tells us what those demon teachings that people are going to walk away from their faith are, and it's surprising. So look at verse 3. These are the teachings that are coming from the liars who have seared consciences. Verse 3. Who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Now, if you're reading slow, you caught that. Like the, the balance, the scale. This is demonic. These are liars. They have seared consciences. It's causing people to walk away from Christ. Well, what are those teachings that, that are coming out? Don't get married and stay away from certain foods. Do you see the imbalance there? I mean, you would think, well, those are superfluous issues. He says, no, those are the teachings of demons. Forbidding marriage and abstaining from certain foods. Now, these are two contextual legalistic items that were being fought over in the first century. In the early church, so when we're reading these things, these are 2,000 year old documents talking to a church in the Roman Empire, specifically the church at Ephesus with this book of 1 Timothy. But in the early church, most of the legalisms that were showing up in the church and being fought over were coming out of Jewish traditions. That's because most of the early church were Jews who converted to Christ. They believed that Christ was the fulfillment of the Old Testament and that he was indeed the Messiah. So the question that was being asked 2,000 years ago is, how much of the Old Testament do we need to adhere to still? Like now that Christ has saved us, now that the Messiah has come, how much of this part of the Bible do we need to, to follow still? And that's where a lot of legalism was born. So some of those examples, let me just give you a few examples of legalisms in the old church, the early church. First, Sabbath regulations was a big point of contention in the early church. What, on the Sabbath, on the day of rest, what constitutes work and what constitutes rest so that I will observe the Sabbath faithfully and please God? And there were fights about this. There were disagreements over this. Another one was circumcision. Circumcision was a big point of, uh, of debate. Read the book of Galatians. They talk about that a lot in that book. But, but, but the question was whether a man had to be circumcised once he converted to Christianity. Like, like if he was not circumcised as an infant in a Jewish context, did he need to now become circumcised because he was a follower of God through Christ? Now, this really wasn't as big of a deal for the first few years of the church when almost all the members of the church were Jews who had been circumcised on the eighth day. But then, once the gospel spread to the Gentiles and these adult men are starting to convert to Christianity, they didn't think it was such a great idea to be circumcised. And it's understandable, right? Just by the way, we, we don't require any surgery to be a member at Fathom. And every man said amen, right? Like that's, but they were, they were battling about this. There's battles about which day we should worship in the, in the uh, New Testament. Should you worship on the Jewish Shabbat, so Saturday? Or should we worship on the first day of the week because that's the day that Jesus rose from the dead? So do we worship on Sunday? There were fights fought over that. Another big one was eating meat sacrificed to idols. 
Read about this in 1 Corinthians. In a pagan Greco-Roman society, here's how meat was distributed. Uh, The best cuts of meat were often brought to pagan temples, and they were sacrificed to these demon gods. And then they would take that meat, because the gods weren't really gods, and they didn't really do anything with the meat, so they just bring that meat back out, and then they'd sell it in the market. That's how they'd make a profit. And so you can see how some Christians would have a problem with that. Like, gosh, I really want this dry-aged ribeye. But it was, it was sacrificed to a demon, so I'm not sure, as a Christian, I should be eating that. And you got the guy over here with a Traeger grill that's like, bro, the Bible doesn't say it explicitly. Get that thing on there. We're going medium rare, right? Like, and it was a fight. It was a fight. Now, today we don't have the same legalisms. We don't battle over those same things. But the underlying principle is still the same. Legalism is taking a matter of conscience and making it a command. So in this verse today, the two rules, forbidding marriage and abstaining from certain foods, does the Bible, first, does the Bible forbid marriage? No. No, just, okay, no is the correct answer to that question. No. No, it's not. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Proverbs 18, 22. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Genesis 2, 24. Marriage is a good thing. It's a good gift to humanity. And Paul also says, hey, it's also a good thing if, you, if you're called to remain single. Marriage isn't the only way. Being a single person is good too because it allows you to be undivided in your service to the Lord. But these evil teachers are trying to teach that if you want to be really spiritual, like if you want to be like varsity team spiritual, then you need to abstain from marriage. They forbid it. And while that might be a matter of conscience for some, it is not a command for all. That's, that's legalism. And then the second one was food. Okay, abstinence from food is another common one that we find in the New Testament, uh, specifically because in Judaism, some foods are considered to be unclean and therefore must be avoided. But then if you read Acts chapter 10, Peter is at a Gentile's house, a big sheet falls from heaven, and he sees the, the best verse of the entire Bible, Peter, arise, kill, and eat. Right, all my PETA friends don't like that verse, but I'm like, hey, arise, kill, and eat, sign me up, right? And, and in that moment, all things were declared clean for the Christian. All foods are declared permissible. So prohibiting certain foods is not a command for a Christian. So that's the text. Now you're like, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me because marriage, food, like these are old school New Testament, 2,000-year-old legalisms, what does that have to do with us? What I'd like to do with the remainder of our time is to work through legalism for us today because I believe it's just as harmful and just as demonic today as it was in the first century. So here's what I want to do. I want to apply this by talking about the idea of wisdom. I want to talk about wisdom for the rest of our time. Because I want to make one thing clear. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having extra rules, regulations, practices, or disciplines for yourself. There's nothing wrong with that at all. There are many matters of wisdom that each individual Christian should take into consideration when when, when you deal with how you should behave. So may, maybe you add something into your life, a restriction or something like that, that's not explicitly commanded in the Bible, but you do it to protect yourself against maybe a particular weakness that you are prone to. Like, that's completely fine. Add, actually, that's what we call wisdom, <laughs> is adding an extra barrier for yourself because you know I'm prone to fall off on this issue. I better stay further away from the crevice than the Bible even prescribes. The other way is we might add something into our life positively to help us grow in an area. 
a grow of, in an area that you want to, to develop or you want to protect. Like you can, you can add things to your life or you can avoid things that aren't explicitly added to or prohibited by the, the scriptures. So I want to say those are matters of wisdom. Here's a couple of uh, illustrations of this. Is it appropriate for Christians to drink alcohol? Well, there are different opinions on this. There are different opinions. Now, here's what I can say with confidence. Drinking alcohol is permitted in the scriptures. It is permitted in the scriptures. But self-control is a command in the scriptures. Drunkenness is prohibited in the scriptures. And addiction is prohibited in the scriptures. So how we handle alcohol then becomes a matter of conscience and wisdom for each individual. But it would be legalistic to say Christians should never drink alcohol anywhere ever. That's legalism. So if you struggle with alcohol or or have an addiction to alcohol and you are unable to exercise self-control with alcohol then it is wisdom to add a non-biblical command to your life to stay away from alcohol. That's wisdom. That's an extra-biblical prohibition for yourself. It becomes legalism when you say everybody else has to do this too. Now for others, you might be bound by your conscience at times to abstain from alcohol so as not to lead somebody astray. There might be certain cases where you need to know who's around you and things like that. And so there might be times where the wisdom-bound Christian will abstain from alcohol. And then there are others that you can choose to drink alcohol responsibly and you know how to do that. But it's not a one-size-fits-all answer to that question. You can set up a tool of wisdom for yourself, but it's legalism when you take a tool and make it into a rule. That's where legalism shows up. I was trying to think of other ones this week and I thought of this one. Uh, Do you want to see Christian mamas go crazy? I do, okay? Uh, You want to see Christian mamas go crazy? Here's what you do. Ask them the best way to educate their children. Right? I mean, just get, get like a public school mama and a homeschool mama and put them in a cage together and just see what happens. I mean, you could pay pay-per-view for that show. That would be really, really interesting. A homeschool mama will say things like this. Well, we, we homeschool our 12 kids. <laughs> and you can send your child to that God-forsaken public school where they outlaw prayer and outlaw God and outlaw the Ten Commandments. Uh, but, 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 and you can have them raised to believe that they're like, crawled out of the primordial ooze and their grandfather is an ape and that, you know, like they'll get hooked on drugs and porn. Like, that's fine. That's fine. You can do that. Uh, But we love our kids. (laughs) We love our kids. And we want to raise our kids in the Lord. And we've got a limited time to do that. And so we think homeschool is the best way to do that. And then the public school mama is going to reply with fear and anger in her eyes. She will say, oh, that's all good and fine, but there's some things that we want for our kid that public school seems to provide, like one of them being social skills. (laughs) We'd like that, okay? And it's cool that your kids can make their own clothes and you started a family bluegrass band, uh, but, (laughs) but, but, but we wanted something to be taught to them like uh, something called math. We'd like them to know math, you know? So we send them to the public school. And the Bible says that that as Christians, we're to take the gospel into the whole world. And so what happens if, if we pull all of the Christian witness out of the public schools? Like what happens at that point to those places? And then the third mama shows up at the cage and says, hey, we send our kids to private school. And both the other mamas are like, hey, way to flex on us with that, you know? But, but, but don't you see it's a matter of conscience? It's a matter of conscience. It's a matter of wisdom. It's not black and white in the Bible how you should educate your children. So it's something for you to decide and not push on to other people. When I was in school, I told you this a couple weeks ago, but it was all about media Media consumption, the legalistic battle was about that. Do you listen to Christian music or secular music? Do you watch Friends? Remember that? 
Some of you remember that, like Friends. Do you watch that demon show, Friends? Joey, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> do you see rated R movies? Till Mel Gibson screwed that one up for us, right? <laughs> see, wisdom, wisdom means you make decisions for yourself on those things. How about politics? Did we get enough of that last week? There is no political party that every Christian has to vote for. That would be legalism. And I know we covered that last week, but just a quick little sidebar, okay? Hey, thank you for being a church where we can preach like we did last week. Thank you for being a congregation where I can say some of the things that I said last week. Uh, thank you to our elders. Who, I mean, listen, those kinds of messages aren't church growth model messages, okay? So thank you for that. And I also want to bless the Lord that we live in a country where I can talk like that and I get a few nasty emails, but I wasn't arrested for what I said. I mean, for real, did you know that most of the world, if you talk like that about your government and critique like that publicly about your government, someone's kicking down your door and taking you away, your freedoms are impinged upon. I mean, praise the Lord that we live in the country that we do, that I got to do what I did last week. So I know I don't have any more time for politics today, but, but that is not a matter of legalism either. It's a matter of conscience. So these matters of wisdom, these matters of conscience, they become legalisms when you start requiring them of others. So remember this, tools are good. Turning tools into rules for all is bad. That's where it becomes legalism. And we as human beings have a propensity to take a tool for us and turn it into a rule for everyone else. And that's where people get beat up. But please be very wise about how you apply these individual things to yourself. It is not legalism if you struggle with alcohol to stay away from alcohol. That's not legalism, that's wisdom. It's not legalism to have filters on your phones and your computers and things like that if you've got a porn problem. That's not legalism, that's wisdom. It's not legalism to get counseling if you struggle with anger or anxiety or depression. That's not legalism, that's wisdom. Legalism takes the tool and turns it into a rule. Now, why is this legalism such a problem for us still? Like, you might think to yourself, well, that's why, Chris, we're at Fathom, because we're not going to try and hold a bunch of people to a bunch of extra biblical stuff. Like, we're just going to follow the Bible. So, like, why is this such a problem? Like, why do we even really need to be worried about this? And I think we need to be worried about it because Paul is genuinely worried about it. And I think it's a bit arrogant for us to believe that we aren't probably prone to the same things that they were 2,000 years ago. But also, also, I think it's a big deal because... While we can put legalistic procedures and policies on to others, and that's wrong, I think we can also at times make our matters of wisdom legalisms for ourselves. Now follow me on this. Your own personal rules and boundaries and borders and wisdom issues can become a self-imposed legalism the moment you think that your standing with God is affected by how you do with those rules. You can become a self-imposing legalist. And I think that is demonic. Legalism gives us an illusion of control. It allows us to believe that we can control our standing with the God of the universe through our behavior. And, and, and hey, I, I love you, but here's the truth. You getting all of the wisdom issues in your life figured out is not what makes God pleased with you. Like that's not the gospel. Obedience and those sorts of things, uh, wisdom issues, are extremely helpful for us. But I just need you to know, that's not what saves you. 
That's not what saves you. Some of us mistakenly think that God will finally be pleased with us once we get our acts together. It's one of the grossest lies that comes with legalism. That if somehow we like crack the code and do all the right stuff and avoid all the wrong stuff, then he'll love us. Then he'll be pleased with us. Then we won't have to be worried as to whether he calls us son or daughter. And I'm just telling you, that's not the gospel. You can become a self-imposing legalist. And that's just as demonic as trying to impose it on someone else. Just thinking, I gotta try harder at this. And I've been just trying to convince you for almost 10 years at this church that there's so much more to following Jesus than simply trying to correct your behavior. There's just so much more to following Jesus than trying harder to be a good Christian and trying harder to go to church and trying harder to tithe or trying harder not to watch those types of movies or trying harder not to drink so much. But the gospel isn't, God is good, you are bad, try harder. That's not the message of the gospel. Jesus saves you, not your obedience. Jesus saves you, not your wisdom. Jesus saves you, not how much you don't drink or do drink, not how much you cuss or don't cuss, not what kind of filth you watch on TV or listen to. or Like, none of those things save you. Only Jesus can save. And legalism, by the way, it it, it only will lead you to two places personally. One place it can lead you to is pride because you think you're better than everyone else. Because you got this figured out that, hey, there's the line. I'm so far behind the line that I'll never trip and fall over that thing. But all y'all standing close to the edge there, shame on you. It'll lead you to pride or it will lead you to exhaustion. Because every time you step over one of those man-made barricades and you say to yourself, Again? I promised I'd never do that again. I said to myself last time when I was throwing up in the bathroom that I would never touch that stuff again. I said in the pit of my heart after I had messed up that I would never watch that filth again and I just did that again and you'll feel such shame and exhaustion that I believe you will run from Christ because of your own self-imposed legalism. And both of those things, pride and shame, will lead you away from a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. So I've been um, thinking about how to end this sermon with an illustration, and I couldn't come up with anything better than an illustration I've used uh, like a million times. So if you know this illustration, uh, I'm using it again, and I'm going to keep using it because it's the best one I know, okay? But you need to hear this. Legalistically managing your sin... Uh, is like this. When I was a kid, my brother and I, uh, we took swimming lessons at the YMCA, at the Y. Uh, And one of our favorite things at the swim lessons uh, were the kickboards. Now these kickboards, like the foam boards that help you kind of float, the kickboards, you kick around on those things. We loved those things. We'd smack each other with those things. That was great. Uh, But one of the games that we played with the kickboard is that we would go into the pool and we would take the kickboard and we would push the kickboard under the water and try and like hold it there, sometimes with our feet, sometimes just with our hands, and we would try to hold the, the board under the water for as long as we possibly could. Did anybody else play this game with a kickboard, okay? It's, a, it's kind of a normal thing, okay? So we're holding these kickboards under the water, uh, and how long you could hold them under the water depended on three things. First, how strong you were. The stronger you were, the longer you could hold that under the water. Second, how tired you were from swimming lessons. Like, was it one of those timed treads? This timed tread thing where you're just exhausted or were you pretty fresh still? And then the third, you know, variable in the kickboard game was how greasy you were from the copious amounts of sunscreen that mama lubed us up with, right? Those were the three things, how strong you were, how tired you were, how greasy you were. That's how you knew that you were good at the kickboard game. Well, none of it really mattered though because eventually 
eventually that kickboard was going to come up out of the water. Now, have you ever released a kickboard from under the water? Does that just gently float up to the surface? No. No, a kickboard rockets out of the water, defying the laws of physics, normally jacking you in the face on its way up, right? That's how a kickboard comes out of the water. And that's legalism. That's the game. We are holding our behaviors under the waterline. And with all of our strength and with all of our tiredness and with all of our greasy fingers, we're just trying desperately to keep that thing below the line. Don't smoke. Don't drink. Don't watch that type of show. Don't dress like that. Don't fill it, fill in the blank. And we're holding it under, and you're good as long as you're holding those things under the waterline. And I'm just wondering if some of you are doing that today. If you've got self imposed legalisms that you're just exhausted. And I wonder if you're shaking a little bit because it's been under there for so long. Or missing, maybe you know the illustration all too well, and you gave up holding that thing a long time ago, and it jacked you so hard in the face. You're still trying to recover. If you're doing that, thinking that as long as I hold these things under the water, I'm good, you're not believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't do it. Let it go. It might even jack you in the face. It's better. I promise it's better than living this exhaustion of holding it under. If I could just get you to believe this, we would be miles ahead. You don't obey to get God to love you. No, he loves you first and then you obey. You don't obey to get God to love you. No, he loves you. And in response to that, you obey. That's why when Moses receives the law, it's not before he goes and releases the Israelites from captivity in Egypt. It's not like, here's the Ten Commandments. Once you nail these things, then we will let your people go. Now, Moses shows up to people who don't really like him, and he releases them from slavery, and then God gives them the law. He frees them first and then gives him uh, commands to obey. And the same is true for us, church. He loves you first, and then you obey as a response. You don't hold it under in order to get him to love you. Legalism can't save you. Only Jesus can. So turn to him. Gosh, put those wisdom pieces into practice. You really should. You shouldn't play right out on the edge. But that's not what saves you. They can only take you so far. Paul calls legalism demonic. It's counterproductive to your faith. Trust in Christ. Let your obedience come from that. He's enough. He's enough. Let's pray together. So Father, when we come to a text like this where where really heavy language is used and and really serious topics are addressed. Lord, sometimes it's easy to just shut our brains down or think it doesn't apply to us or think it's a historical thing. Or, and yet, Father, I seem to I seem to think that that the problems that were happening in the early church are probably the same problems that are happening here. Some of us, we have a, a standard for others that the Bible never makes that standard. Like we've raised the proverbial bar for other people that Jesus himself doesn't set. So if we're doing that, Father, Lord, I pray that we would repent of that. Lord, we repent of the legalism that we've cast on others. We acknowledge that that's sinful, that it's demonic teaching. 
But Lord, there's probably also some of us in here who we feel some self-imposed legalism today. If we could just try harder, then maybe he'd be happy with us. If we could just get some things in line, then maybe you would finally think that we're worthy to be your son or your daughter. But Lord, we remind ourselves once again of the good news of the gospel. That while we were still in our sin, Christ died. That while we were at our worst, you gave your first and your best to save us. And now we want to live lives of wisdom because of that, not to earn that, but effort out of that. So God, we repent of our self-imposed legalisms as well. So Holy Spirit, preach to our hearts. Show us areas where we're out of alignment with you. Do your good and, and right work in our lives. We might not be legalists, but that we might be obedient, Christ-loving Christians. Father, we love you. We thank you for this text. And we pray these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit. Amen.